Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, Chapter 8, Intricacy. I hope you're ready for this, because this chapter is the most exuberant in the entire book. It's the climax of the Via Positiva portion. It is Dillard embracing the world with open arms, in all its infinite detail, and trying to take it all in. And it begins, where Chapter 7 left off, with a microscope. This time, instead of looking at pond scum, Dillard is looking at the blood cells within the tail of a goldfish. The goldfish, she says, cost her only 25 cents. And yet, looking at it closely, she sees its infinite complexity. This living thing, down to its transparent tail with tiny blood cells whipping through the capillaries. It fills her with awe and wonder. But she also notes the chloroplasts moving through the plant in the fishbowl. The Elodia plant is incredibly simple. And yet there's nothing simple about the movement of chloroplast through its cells. As she notes the infinite details within both the fish and the plant, she says, We have not yet found the dot so small it is uncreated, as it were, like a metal blank, or merely roughed in, and we never shall. We go down landscape after mobile, sculpture after collage, down to molecular structures like a mob dance in Brugal, down to atoms airy and balanced as a canvas by Klee, down to atomic particles, the hearts of the matter, as spirited and wild as any El Greco saints. And it all works! Nature, said Thoreau in his journal, is mythical and mystical always, and spins her whole genius on the least work. The creator, I would add, churns out the intricate texture of the least works that is the world with a spin-thrift genius and an extravagance of care, this is the point. For the rest of the chapter, she's going to explore this intricacy, how absolutely everything in the natural world is made up of infinite detail. All these things she's been trying to deal with the entire book are made up of smaller and smaller and smaller details, and there are so many things to take in. On page 131, she shifts to the second person. You are God. You want to make a forest, something to hold the soil, lock up solar energy, and give off oxygen. Wouldn't it be simpler just to rough in a slab of chemicals, a green acre of goo? But she doesn't stop there. She continues to use the second person for two more pages, jumping from one perspective to the next in order to understand a tree. You are a man, a retired railroad worker, who makes replicas as a hobby. You decide to make a replica of one tree. She describes the impossible difficulty of getting the tiny details right while holding on to this giant piece of sculpture. Then she jumps to the perspective of a starling, floating through the pines. Then to a sculptor, sculpting the negative space around the tree. Then to the chloroplast, moving through the water. She concludes saying, You are evolution. You have only begun to make trees. You are God. Are you tired? Finished? This second person jump from perspective to perspective causes us to open in wonder to the vision of a single tree unable to take it in or understand why from any of these perspectives. She moves on from the tree to wonder at the fact that everything in the universe has such detail, and how she obsesses over knowing about them. She says, I have often noticed that these things, which obsess me, neither bother nor impress other people even slightly. I am horribly apt to approach some innocent at a gathering and, like the ancient mariner, fix him with a wild, glittering eye and say, do you know that in the head of the caterpillar of the ordinary goat moth there are 228 separate muscles? The poor wretch flees. I am not making chatter. I mean to change his life. I seem to possess an organ that others lack, a sort of trivia machine. Looking at the world of animals, especially the insect world, it seems as though absolutely every kind of creature is able to survive. She says, there is no one standing over evolution with a blue pencil to say, now that one there is absolutely ridiculous and I won't have it. If the creature makes it, it gets a stet. Is our taste so much better than the creator's? Utility to the creature is evolution's only aesthetic consideration. Form follows function in the created world so far as I know. And the creature that functions, however bizarre, survives to perpetuate its form. And she wraps out the first part of the chapter, wondering at all the many, many forms of life within this world. Part two shifts to the idea of landscape. She looks over the world that she's living in, this world around Tinker Creek, and tries to take it all in, not know every single thing within this landscape, but try to understand it, try to find a meaning within it all. 
As she looks at it all, she reflects upon the texture of the Earth. We think of the globe as a sphere, but Pliny, her old favorite, says that the globe should be more like a pineapple pricked by irregularities. Not just the wild slopes and peaks of mountains, but the intricate texture down to the face of a loved one. On page 142, she has a dream, a waking dream. She floats up and observes the earth, but not just the texture of the earth in this moment, but the texture of the earth across time. And she begins to reflect on time's role in the complexity and texture of this infinitely intricate earth. She cites John Dee's idea of hurling a mirror into space faster than the speed of light so that you could watch the earth through time. She says on page 144, What would you see? Transparent images moving through light, an infinite storm of beauty, which she then goes on to imagine, ending in the appearance of a dot, a flesh flake. It swells like a balloon, it moves, circles, slows, and vanishes. This is your life. Our lives are a brief dot within the infinite complexity of the earth. She returns to an image she had in chapter 1. Our life is a faint tracing on the surface of mystery. The surface of mystery is not smooth any more than the planet is smooth. Not even a single hydrogen atom is smooth, let alone a pine. If we are so small in the midst of an infinitely complicated mystery, what is even our point? On page 146, she says, What is man that thou art mindful of him? This is where the great modern religions are so unthinkably radical, the love of God. For we can see that we are as many as the leaves of trees. But it could be that our faithlessness is a cowering cowardice, born out of our very smallness, a massive failure of imagination. Certainly, nature seems to exult in abounding radicality, extremism, anarchy. If we are to judge nature by its common sense or likelihood, we wouldn't believe the world existed. In nature, improbabilities are the one stock in trade. The whole creation is one lunatic fringe. If creation had been left up to me, I'm sure I wouldn't have had the imagination or courage to do more than shape a single reasonably sized atom, smooth as a snowball, and let it go as that. No claims of any and all revelations could be so far-fetched as a single giraffe. And so, she concludes, this speckled and spotted world is our birthright. She says on page 147, Intricacy is that which is given from the beginning, the birthright. And an intricacy is the hardiness of complexity that ensures against the failure of all life. This is our heritage, the piebald landscape of time. We walk around, we see a shred of the infinite possible combinations of an infinite variety of forms. A moment later, she says, The wonder is, given the errant nature of freedom and the burgeoning texture of time, the wonder is that all the forms are not monsters, that there is beauty at all, grace gratuitous, pennies found, the mockingbird's free fall. Beauty itself is the fruit of the Creator's exuberance that grew in such a tangle, and the grotesques and the horrors bloom from that same free growth, that intricate scramble and twine up and down the conditions of time. This, then, is the extravagant landscape of the world, given, given with pizzazz, given in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And in fact, it is the conclusion of the Via Positiva portion of the book. But she's going to change her mind, and we'll have to wait through the next chapter to find out why. Her conclusion, then, is that this wild, intricate world is a gift, blossoming with both beauty and grotesque, and here we can stand with open arms and take it all in. I told you this was exuberant. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.